of the contenders who stand the best chance to win the SEC this year. Will more than one team make the college football playoff? Or could we see a dark horse make a run this season? What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Ultimate College Football Preview brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE to get $20, or $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I'm Chris Gordy, host of Locked On SEC, joined by our fellow Locked On hosts from across the conference. We're joined tonight by Daniel Monroe of Locked On Bulldogs, Jimmy Stein of Locked On Bama, Caroline Fenton of Locked On LSU and Eric Kane from Locked On Vols. Guys, we will start here. When we're looking at the contenders in the SEC, I think it starts with these four, Georgia, Bama, LSU, and Tennessee. So let's start here. Uh, what does your school need to do to win the championship? Daniel, let's start with you. What does Georgia need to do? Uh, I think Georgia's path to the SEC championship game um, is they need to – stay injury free and they need to play uh up to the standard football that they have they've set for the last couple seasons it certainly doesn't hurt that we don't have to play caroline or jimmy's teams during the regular season much has been made about the georgia schedule and um there's no getting around it um georgia does have old miss and tennessee both late in the season both of those teams stand to be Seem to be pretty good. Tennessee, probably very good. That game's on the road. I mean, that that seems to be the game that's going to decide the SEC East. And so for Georgia early on, it's about taking care of business. And as we get later in the season, they're, they're going to have to win those big games to get back to Atlanta. Yeah, uh, I think Georgia's going to be just fine. I think I saw a couple of high schools on their schedule this year, so they should be uh, should be undefeated there towards the end of the season. Jimmy, what does Alabama – what's their biggest game, uh, on your opinion, to get to Atlanta? Well, the biggest game to get to Atlanta is probably the game against LSU. Uh, you know, that that's late November. Uh, you know, it has nothing to do with the SEC standings, but the biggest game on Alabama's schedule, I think, is week two, the non-conference game against – the Texas Longhorns, only simply that's the tone setter. And it's, it's all about has Alabama found a quarterback uh, in week two. If Alabama beats Texas, plays well, and has found their quarterback, then the SEC schedule looks a little different, right? But if you don't have a quarterback, that game doesn't go well, all of a sudden a lot of SEC games are in play for Alabama. So really I think that's the one that sort of tips the scales on what happens with Alabama this season. But in terms of getting to Atlanta and in the conference standings, I look at LSU as the biggest challenger, of course, for Alabama in the West. That game is at home in Tuscaloosa in early November. But as Caroline knows, uh, for whatever reason, the uh, the home team doesn't always have a ton of luck in the Alabama-LSU game. Uh, visiting teams do pretty well in that series. But but that looks to me to be the matchup that, that may decide who wins the West and, and, and goes to Atlanta. Yeah, and at least uh, Alabama gets that Middle Tennessee State warm up to try to figure out this whole quarterback thing if it's not decided by week one. Uh, Caroline, we saw Brian Kelly in year one win the West. Can he do it again? What's LSU's biggest uh, obstacle this year? I think it lies in can this offense be as consistent and just flat out good as it was in its three best three game stretch of the season. It's best three games of the season, that stretch of Ole Miss, Florida, and Alabama. That's when you really saw everything come together. That's when you saw Jaden Daniels have a certain sense of confidence that we didn't see at the beginning of last season. That's when this offensive line was really finding its stride. You had good chemistry between those five guys up front. The offense took some time which was to be understood, a new head coach, a new offensive coordinator. You have a quarterback transferring in. You've got two true freshmen on the outside of the offensive line. There was a lot of figuring out that this offense had to do, this, this whole team had to do this past season, but specifically the offense. So if the offense can start off this season where it left off this past season, where Jaden Daniels can take a step forward in year two, where this offensive line can take a step forward in year two, how the tight ends are being utilized, how we saw with Mason Taylor this, this past season. If all of that can start where it left off, I think this team is in good shape. But if you're still going to take your time settling into this season, I, the schedule doesn't really allow you to do that. You start off with Florida State, another preseason top 10 team. LSU doesn't have the luxury of playing, you know, a 
high school team like Georgia, maybe start off the season with Middle Tennessee State like Alabama does. So they got to get things figured out quickly. But I think it all lays in that offense. Yeah, only two schools in the SEC bring back their head coach, offensive coordinator, and starting quarterback, and that's LSU and Vanderbilt of all schools. So going to be interested to see with that continuity. Eric, uh, Tennessee, kind of that team, you know, second-tier team in the East that everybody thinks they're looking at that Georgia game saying that's the game. But how does Tennessee – get to Atlanta this year. Yeah, I mean, it's all about the quarterback. You saw how effective Josh Hobble's offense has always been with a quarterback that's, you know, producing and being efficient. And you saw the last two years with Hendon Hooker. But for Tennessee, it's all about Joe Milton. If he can, you know, maybe not play up to the level of Hendon Hooker, but play efficiently and, you know, play, you know, minimize the turnovers and be accurate with the football. And, uh, you know, Tennessee will go as Joe Milton. But when you look at the schedule, of course, uh, kind of like Jimmy was saying with week two with Texas. Of course, this is an SEC game, but week three at Florida, it's going to be huge for Tennessee, a place Tennessee hasn't won since 2003. You got a win over Florida last year, which was obviously big. And if there's ever a year to win down in the swamp, it better be this year, right? Because you know Florida's not going to be down for, for much longer, in my opinion. But this is a very winnable game for Tennessee. That's coming in week three. Of course, South Carolina in week four is going to be, or week five is going to be huge. A&M at home. You have the third Saturday in October. That's going to be on the road in Tuscaloosa. You know that Alabama is going to want to get that game this year, especially with the way that uh, it lost last year at Neyland Stadium. At Kentucky's not going to be uh, at Kentucky's going to be a challenge, but of course, it's the Georgia game. So my point is, Tennessee's going to be tested so many times by the time it hosts Georgia November the 18th at Neyland Stadium. We know what everybody's questions are. We've kind of talked about that in recent weeks. I want to know what what you feel best about with your team. Daniel, let's start with you. What are you most confident in with Georgia this year? I think when you look at Georgia, the, the biggest the biggest question is obviously the quarterback. Everybody knows that, the offensive coordinator. But I think the skill positions on offense and the offensive line absolutely shape up to be one of the big strengths of Georgia's team. Obviously, they return Brock Bowers, who's the the all-everything pass catcher in the SEC. A lot of talent. A.D. Mitchell goes to Texas at wide receiver, but a lot of talent. They bring in two guys in Dominic Lovett um, from Missouri, Rara Thomas from Mississippi State. Um, in the case of Dominic Lovett especially, very productive SEC pass catchers. Um, and so... You've got a lot of returning talent at the skill positions on offense, and then four of the five uh, offensive linemen coming back, if you include Amarius Mims, the right tackle who played a lot of football, even though he wasn't technically a starter. I, he was in on the second play of the national championship game and played most of that game. He played a lot of football for Georgia. So four out of the five spots on the offensive line, all the offensive skill positions, I think everybody looks at Georgia's defense. They basically, I mean, they return a ton uh, from that defense last year, losing Jalen Carter, the biggest the biggest loss, obviously, and uh, Christopher Smith, Keely Ringo out of the secondary. But returning a lot of production on defense. But I'm actually, if, if they can figure out the quarterback, I'm actually most excited about the continuity on the offensive side of the ball uh, for Georgia this year. So I think that'll be a strength that they will lean on as the season goes on. Yeah, it's uh, something when you can change out OCs and it doesn't matter. You're, you're still as confident in the offense and scoring points. Uh, Jimmy, let's go over to you. What do you think is, is Bama's biggest strength or, or what are you most confident in with, with Bama? Actually, uh, and it's a little different than what we've seen from Alabama in the most recent past, but running the football, I think with, uh, with Bryce Young, you obviously do what, what the offense does best with Bryce Young. That was throw the ball around a lot and, it was really effective. Alabama scored the most points in college football over the past two seasons. But at the same time, there have been many instances in the games where Alabama had a difficult time converting even third and shorts, fourth and shorts. I think there's a return or a renewed emphasis in the power ground game. And there's a lot of evidence that that's the focus for Alabama. They hired an offensive coordinator who's, who's run an offense that's based on physicality and featuring tight ends and running the ball a lot. They, signed two of the top three running backs in the country in the 2023 uh, recruiting class. Uh, you bring in a transfer portal tight end from Maryland who's a block first guy, a 250-pound tight end to help seal that edge. I, I think this is just a return to running the football. Uh, the right side of the offensive line in particular looks fantastic with J.C. Latham, a potential first-team All-American, Tyler Booker, a year younger, but but really in Latham's ballpark as a player and a returning center. 
I think running the football, being, going back to kind of a back to the future sort of a thing with Nick Saban, I think he wants to run the ball, do a little bit like you saw earlier in the Saban era. And I'm, I'm pretty confident they have the pieces in place to do that. Carolina, I know you talked a little bit about Jaden Daniels and that offense already, but but what is, and we talk about things keeping us up at night, what's not keeping you up at night with this LSU team? It's a hard question to answer because I can't pick just one, which let me tell you, Gordy, that is so refreshing this year to be able to have so many things that I can choose that I feel confident in versus last year going into Brian Kelly's first season having nothing but questions. But I would say I'll pick one offense and one defense. Defensively, it has to be the front seven. I mean, you've got you've got Mason Smith returning from injury. He tore his ACL in the first game of the season against Florida State last year, returning him poised for a breakout season. You have Makai Wingo returning, who stepped up when Mason Smith went down with an injury last year. He has emerged as a leader on the field, off the field, and has been a force on the defensive line. Of course, returning Harold Perkins, who I believe is going to be one of the best, if not the best, defensive player in college football this year. And then you bring in Omar Spates, a four-year star at Oregon State on the defensive line. You've got Ovia Gufo transferring in from Texas, who actually spent the beginning of his career at Notre Dame with Brian Kelly, who's coming in, who's likely slated to fill in that Jack linebacker position, filling B.J. Ojolari's spot. So you've got a whole lot of experience on that defensive line, and there's a whole lot of guys that are proven and also poised to do even more this year. Harold Perkins filling in into kind of that Will linebacker spot. Makai Wingo, now that he's a certified starter, I'm excited what they can do and build upon in year two. And I know that Mason Smith is going to be coming back hungry after sitting out the entirety of the season last year with a torn ACL. I think if I have to choose one offensively, it's probably the run game. And it's really for no reason other than this room is stacked. They've got so much depth. Returning Noah Kane, Josh Williams, Armani Goodwin, and John Emery. You're adding adding Trey Holly, a four-star running back from Louisiana, into the mix. You're also adding Logan Diggs from, from Notre Dame into the mix. You've got so many options. You've got a whole lot of depth. So I'm excited to see what offensive coordinator Mike Dunbrock does with the run game, how they kind of use this running back by committee and how they're able to utilize this depth to their advantage. Cause that's something that Brian Kelly has emphasized so much is the difference between this LSU team being a national title contender and not is depth. Eric, uh, we'll jump over to you. We're talking not uh, what's keeping us up and not uh, up at night, but what we're most confident in, what are you most confident in with Tennessee this year? You know, it's funny. You lose the Blitnikoff Award winner in Jalen Hyatt. You lose Cedric Tillman, who was a 1,000-yard receiver in 2021. And you would think that you're going to take a step back at receiver, but I think Tennessee's receivers are going to be really good this year. You have Brew McCoy, who had over 800 yards receiving a season ago. Romel Keaton, who is getting a whole lot of offseason praise. Uh, you've got uh, Squirrel Wide, who showed up really big in, in the Orange Bowl and some other games last year. And then, of course, you bring in Dante Thornton, who gives you a different dynamic in the slot, long, explosive. And you know, Tennessee pretty much has four starting receivers, and they only play three. And so I think there's a whole lot of confidence in the wide receivers. But as I mentioned earlier, it's all about the quarterback. And uh, you got to have a quarterback that can play efficiently and get the football out there. But I think Tennessee's wide receivers are going to be a strength uh, for Josh Heupel this season. Could someone make a dark horse run this season, the SEC? We're going to tackle that next on the Ultimate College Football Preview on Locked on SEC. First, I want to remind you guys, this episode is presented to you by our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. Look, these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business, and you want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you got to go check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helping you find the right people for your team faster, and for free, it's very simple. You go to their website, you post your job for free, you add the uh, purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile. That's going to spread the word that you're hiring. And then they offer simple tools like screening questions, going to make it easy for you to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you want to interview and hire. It is why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs, helping you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college. Go post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. 
We've talked about the four favorites, but what about the rest of the conference? We bring in the rest of our Locked On hosts, Zach Blackerby of Locked On Auburn, Lance Dahl of Locked On Kentucky, Andrew Stefaniak of Locked On Aggies, John Neighbors, Locked On Razorbacks, Andrew Lyon, Locked On Gamecocks, Brandon Olson, Locked On Gators, Stephen Willis, Locked On Ole Miss, and John Miller, Locked On Mizzou. It is quite a, a haul we have here. Zach, I want to start with you. What does a successful season look like for Hugh Freeze in Auburn in year one? Yeah, I mean, it's been a wild off season, and, and I hope all of you guys brought your jackets because there's a freeze warning happening throughout the remainder of the conference. But I, I think uh, I think seven and five is becoming the expectation. Um, and, and I think eight and four or anything better than that would be something that that Auburn fans would happily, happily accept with this first year in the Hugh Freeze era. John Miller, locked on Mizzou. I know Eli Drinkwitz got the big extension. What does Mizzou have to do to make a run this year? Honestly, very similar to what Zach just said about his program. Give me seven and five. Give me eight and four. I'm really happy this season because so far under Drinkwitz, the, the program has made baby steps every year. Really, last year should have been the breakthrough. Hopefully, this is it this season. Never had a winning season. I think this is it for Drinkwitz and company. John Neighbors, the Razorbacks, bring back K.J. Jefferson, bring back Rocket Sanders, one of the best runners in the SEC. Uh, what's the path for Arkansas here? Well, I think everybody's expecting at least seven wins. you got to improve on last season, which was an epic disappointment. They shouldn't have gone 6-6. Six and six. They should have been a lot better, but it's kind of the story of Razorback sports. It's always about shoulda and coulda, but you actually got to execute it. But Arkansas does have K.J. Jefferson back. they got Rocket Sanders, who is arguably the best running back, the best running back in the SEC, in my opinion. He's also gotten bigger, faster, stronger. The secondary has improved dramatically, and they've made some needed coaching changes at the coordinator position. The schedule is actually easier overall. They do have a tough stretch in the middle of it. But anything less than seven and five, Razorback fans are not going to be happy. I think eight and four is absolutely in the driver's seat of what they're probably going to do. And nine and three, if you told me that, I wouldn't be surprised either. But I think there's a lot of reasons to be confident about Arkansas this year. Lance Daw, Kentucky loses a lot, brings in a lot. Mark Stoops hitting up that transfer pool, getting a new running back, a new quarterback, and oh, by the way, a good OC returning in Liam Cohen. What's Kentucky need to do to make a run? Well, I think like you just mentioned, it starts and ends with what this offense can do. Now, something that we didn't mention is the offensive line retooling there through the transfer portal. I think that's going to be a big factor in what Kentucky does in big time games this season. Speaking of the schedule, it's pretty manageable. Can all things considered, you get both Alabama and Tennessee at home. I'm very excited to see what Devin Leary looks like underneath Liam Cohen, who was here in 2021. It's all about whether or not the Wildcats can put up points. Brad White, the defensive coordinator here for the Wildcats, has had them consistent on that side of the ball for four years running now. I'm expecting good things from him and that unit, but overall, it's about scoring points at UK. Yeah, J.J. Weaver back. We'll see what they can do. We head on down to the swamp. Talk with Brandon Olson about the Florida Gators. Uh, not the best year one for Billy Napier, but expectations raised for year two. What's Florida need to do to make a run this year? Yeah, uh, the reigning Pac-12 champion Florida Gators are are kind of <laughs> – I'm not like everybody. We're like seven wins, eight – bowl eligibility is the goal here. You got a tough schedule this year, six top 25 opponents, five in the top 15. Ain't going to be an easy year if you're the Florida Gators. A lot of roster turnover, less explosive team here, obviously. But it's one of those times where we're looking at a team where recruiting's going really well. The process is underway to get Florida back to where Florida belongs of just pure greatness. But this year, I think reasonably, if you can get bowl eligible again, then you're looking at what I would consider a successful season in Gainesville. Ground and pound. That's what Florida's got to do this year to be successful. Andrew Lyon, host of Locked On Gamecocks. You bring back Spencer Radler, Juice Wells, at wide receiver, a lot of weapons. What's South Carolina got to do to make a run? Well, Chris, I think that for South Carolina, you know, same deal as Brandon just said, you got a really tough schedule coming up this year. You got a brutal road slate with games against Georgia, Tennessee, Texas A&M, and also a game against Missouri that you have not won in several years. So for Shane Beamer Company, can you defeat the teams that you defeated last year once again, teams like Kentucky, maybe knock off a Tennessee? And can you also get back against the Florida Gators? Can you knock off the Missouri Tigers? All of it's going to rely on Spencer Rattler, Antoine Juice Wells, and that offense. And really, either the offense or defensive side of the ball just catching up to their special teams unit. If the Gamecocks can do that, then they will definitely fulfill expectations in 2023. 
Yeah, it'll be fun to watch what they look like. Over in College Station, Andrew Stefaniak covering Locked On Aggies. Andrew, uh, everything I've read this week in, in terms of season previews, everybody's picking the Aggies as that dark horse. What's the dark horse got to do to make a run? This Texas A&M team, you know, year after year recently, they've been a team that many have had as one of the better teams in the country, let alone the SEC. Now the Aggies are kind of more of the underdog in the conference, and Folks, I think this is a year where Texas A&M makes a run. You return 16 starters, which is the most in the SEC. You return a lot of those 2022 guys. If you look at blue chip ratio, I'm a big believer in that statistic. This is a top five roster in college football, according to blue chip ratio. So there are a lot of pieces for Jimbo Fisher. And recently we found out that Coach Bobby P, Bobby Petrino, is going to be calling plays for the Aggies, which I think that right there is going to lead to wins on the field for Texas A&M. This is a team that I think people that is going to put the college football community on notice sooner than later. Yeah, and I love that uh, the talk is uh, he may be up in the booth. Good. Stay away from Jimbo. We need to separate both you guys, see how it works. Lastly, the Ole Miss Rebels. Stephen Willis, one of the hottest teams to start last year. Not so much down the stretch. How does Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin balance this out and make a run? Well, first of all, you've got the best running back in college football, not just the SEC. And Ole Miss needs to ride him to go as far as they can. Jackson Dart has had an unbelievable fall camp to this point. He has not taken a rep in anything other than the first string. Um, two all-conference USA receivers come into play, Under Armour All-American game. They've retooled their offensive skill pieces, and they also return the whole offensive line. It, they have a chance to be a really explosive unit offensively. The question on this team is going to come to on the defensive side of the ball. I expect it to be a little bit clunky as Pete Golding comes in in his first year, and they have transfers all over the field. I think one player was actually signed by Ole Miss that's going to be played on the defensive side of the ball. But I have them predicted at 9-3. and three. Um you look at ESPN FBI, that 60% probability wins for nine games and over 60% prob probability losses in three games. So they believe that as well. But anyway, I, I think this season should be a lot of fun, and it needs to hurry up and get here seriously. Two of the best runners in the SEC, of course, back in Rocket Sanders and Quinchon Judkins. All right, guys, real quick, rapid fire, quick five seconds from each of you. Give me a team from this group you think could make the SEC championship. That's not your own school. Zach, we'll start with you. Ooh, I'll go. Uh, I'll go with Andrew Stefaniak's team. I'll go with the uh, the Texas A and M Aggies. I think they've got the talent to do it. John Miller, who you got? I'm gonna go locked on Ole Miss. I'm a Lane Kiffin guy. Nice, fun to see that, John Neighbors. This is awful. Uh, give right. me like Auburn, maybe. I don't know. Aggies, just Ooh. pick one. Wait, I don't. John, know. John, say that again, please, just real quick. Yeah. Well, hey, listen, it's not it's it's not a compliment. It just shows you that nobody else has a chance. So. Yeah, that's fine. Arkansas couldn't beat Hugh Freeze at Liberty. So it is what it is. <laughs> Lance, who you got? Yeah, this is uh, this is tough here. I'll, I'll, I'll go with South Carolina and Spencer Rattler, hoping that he can actually make the leap that he was expected to as a five star coming out of high school. Hey, maybe that offense is just crazy elite all of a sudden under under uh, Dow Loggins. Brandon Olson, who you got? That offense ain't crazy elite. I'll tell you that much, Lance. It's better than yours, uh, man. Yeah, debatable because well winning so i i will say i i think i'm going to give it to auburn mainly because i think their schedule is not incredibly tough this year and so i think that gives them a little bit of a leg up there but uh not super confident about any of us that are out here right now that that are going to be in that one especially not texas a and hugh freeze getting the benefit of the doubt andrew lyon who from this group can make it I'm not just returning the favor, Lance, but give me Kentucky. Mark Stoops and the Wildcats are going to surprise a lot of people this fall. Andrew Stefaniak, who you got? I want to say Arkansas. I don't love to say it, but that's who I'm going with. I like the Razorbacks this year. Stephen Willis, nobody's picked the Florida Gators. Who are you taking? Yeah, I mean, I can't vote for myself, so I guess I would give it to John Neighbors and the Arkansas Razorbacks. Very Why nice. Not? We yeah. will see when this thing plays out, guys, who can make that run. There's always a surprise every year in the SEC. We'll see if that is this year. Thank you guys mm -hmm. so much for your time. All right, will the SEC have playoff representation this season? That's next on the Ultimate College Football Preview on Locked On. But first, this episode is presented to you by our friends over at Bird Dogs. Look, Bird Dogs, they are doing their job, making you look good 
with their stretch khaki shorts designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and the leg to give you that truly sculpted look throughout these summer months. Uh, Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. Uh, they fit better than regular shorts that are made of that stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fixing that issue. They got that cloud knit fabric that looks looks just like khaki, but it stretches so you get the waist slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. And of course, they use an anti-stink sweat wicking fabric. Look, we're all sweating right now. It's 100 degrees across the south. Uh, Bird Dogs is taking care of you. So go check them out. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college. Use our promo code uh, locked on college. You will get a free white tech hat with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on college. Use our promo code locked on college. You will get that free white tech hat. You don't want to take your or you won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you that. Go check them out. Birddogs.com slash locked on college. Who from the SEC is going to make the college football playoff this year? We know the SEC will have one. Why? Because they always have at least one. We've had a couple years where we've had two. How many will they get in? And who will those teams be? We go back to our expert panelists of the favorites in the East and the West this year. We start with Daniel Monroe, host of Locked On Bulldogs. Daniel, uh, who from the SEC is getting into the playoff this year? How many teams? Is it one? Is it two? How are we doing? Yeah, I think I've gone back and forth on this as I have thought about it. You know, um, we are going to, you know, this will be the last year of the four-team playoff. And... Alabama was so close to being the first two loss team to make it in to the playoff last year. And I, I really think for there to be two SEC teams in the playoff this year, there's going to need to be a two loss team in it. I, I, I don't see necessarily two teams the way that we had in 2021, for example, with Georgia and Alabama meeting in the SEC championship game, both teams undefeated. In, a, in what amounted to be basically just a seeding game in the playoff. I don't see that happening this year. Jimmy already mentioned Alabama's schedule. We've already talked about Caroline's, you know, an LSU schedule. Um, we've already talked about Georgia's lack of a schedule. Tennessee's got a brutal schedule. And so, like, I don't necessarily, other than Georgia, you'd be hard pressed to just bet your house on one of those, these other three teams that we're talking about, no matter how good they are getting to Atlanta at 11 and one or better. And that's, that's ultimately, I think what it would take. And so if I had to, if I had to bet on one on two, on a two team playoff scenario, it would definitely be an undefeated Georgia losing the SEC championship game to a one loss LSU or Alabama who, you know, maybe Alabama loses to Texas early in the season, then most through the SEC beats Georgia. Maybe, you know, the same thing with LSU with the Florida State game, and then, you know, all that's forgotten by the time they get to Atlanta. So that scenario is definitely possible. I, I personally don't see it happen. I think it'll be a one-bid league for the SEC, and um, in my completely unbiased opinion, that team will probably be Georgia. <laughs> no uh no bias there taken uh it is interesting with ohio state and michigan ranked preseason as high as they are god even if they both end up with one loss one beats the other it feels like they're both getting in again uh but again at alabama and georgia with them being ranked so high if both of them are sitting there either undefeated or with one loss apiece in the sec championship game you got to think both those teams are in no matter the results of that game jimmy where are you how many sec teams are we getting in and who is it in the playoff well, the SEC's had a team in every year. I don't think that's going to change at all. And uh, I, I agree with a lot of what Daniel was saying. I think Georgia is someone you could sort of pencil in. I think they have, uh, not, you know, not the toughest schedule. <laughs> a lot of the talk this off season, but uh, at the same time, I think that schedule, by the way, isn't so tough relative to Georgia. I wonder if Purdue was playing the same schedule if they would say, "Hey, this is a, a cakewalk." I doubt that, but. Uh, I, I think Georgia uh, has a great chance to, to finish the regular season undefeated. I do think the game in Knoxville is going to be very challenging. But uh, if Georgia goes into the SEC championship game undefeated, it's very difficult to imagine them not being in the playoff regardless of what happens. As to whether a second SEC team could, could get in, I think there are pitfalls out there for the Tennessees, for the LSUs, and for the Alabamas. Uh, I think it's going to be imperative that you get to the SEC championship game with only one loss before you play a team as talented as Georgia. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I will say this. I, I think the winner of Alabama LSU 
is probably one of the best four teams in college football this season. I just don't know if that's going to get you in the playoffs. So I'm going to say one, but the winner of of the LSU-Alabama game is going to have an excellent chance. Yeah, that's a great point. It does feel like that's almost a de facto playoff game between LSU and Alabama. Uh, We'll see what both those teams look like when we get there. Caroline, uh, in your mind, who from the SEC gets into the playoff, and is it one or two teams? Yeah, I hate to follow suit, and I hate to, you know, kind of ride the bandwagon, but that's really what it feels right now because it feels like there is an SEC, that we're in an SEC this year where there's so much uncertainty, and really the most certain thing right now feels like it's Georgia and then it's everybody else. I mean, they're just that good. They have one of the biggest, best playmakers in the game in Brock Bowers, and I, I don't see anybody really pulling a huge upset against Georgia, so I fully expect Georgia to go into the SEC championship game undefeated. And even if they do lose that game, I still think that Georgia deserves a bid to the college football playoff. And I think that they would get one. I would agree that that Alabama LSU game feels like it's almost like a college football playoff tryout because I think that that's going to be the game that wins the West. So you win that game, you head to Atlanta. And then at the end of that, it's who has the better schedule. I think that whether it's Alabama or LSU or whoever is the representative for the SEC West, if that team is able to beat Georgia, to hell if they got two wins. If you can beat Georgia, you deserve to compete for a national title. So I do think that there's absolutely a space there. I think there's a possibility and a path for two SEC teams, Georgia and then an SEC West representative. But with so many question marks and so much uncertainty surrounding a whole lot of teams in the West, Alabama included, I wouldn't be surprised to see the West kind of beat up on one another and almost eliminate themselves from contention. So I'd put my money on just Georgia, but there absolutely is a path there for two teams if they're able to upset Georgia in the SEC championship game. Yeah, it's great to pivot to Eric here because, look, you guys talking about Bama was maybe trying to get in as the first two-loss team. We were making a case down the stretch of last season for Tennessee going, if Tennessee wins out, they're going to get in. They went and laid a turd at South Carolina. We know how that worked out. But, uh, Eric, how many SEC teams are getting in the playoff this year? Yeah, uh, again, I, I hate to follow suit, but get, going fourth, third, and fourth in line here, I mean, I, I can't add much more to what these guys have already said. I, uh, You know, when you when you start in the East um, – yeah, I think I think Georgia's got a very good chance of going undefeated. Obviously, the game at Tennessee it's going to be huge. Uh, Georgia's going on the road to Neyland Stadium. You know, what does Georgia look like at that point? You'd expect them to be pretty good, but again, what does Tennessee look like at that point? How has Joe Milton progressed throughout the season as being the guy, as being the starting quarterback? Has Tennessee dropped a game or two by that point in time? Uh, you know, we'll see. I think that's the biggest game for Georgia heading into the SEC championship, uh, and I, I believe they'll go on. So. If I'm if I if I'm betting on a team from the SEC going to the college football playoff, which I believe the SEC champion will go to the college football playoff, and I think it'll be Georgia. Um, and again, to kind of piggyback off, you know, what everybody else said, if somebody were to beat an undefeated Georgia in the SEC championship game, whether they have one loss in the SEC West and LSU and Alabama, I think that team would deserve be deserving, especially with the schedule and the RPI and all that type of stuff that it'll have on its resume. I think that team would be deserving as well. So. I'll say Georgia, um, and again, obviously, November the 18th at Neyland Stadium is going to be huge in that, and Tennessee can you know, try, try to wreck that a little bit, but I'll say Georgia, and then I think there is a path for the winner of the SEC championship game if you do beat Georgia. I'll give you this, guys. I think two SEC teams and two Big Ten teams get in. I think the Big 12 gets left out, the Pac-12 gets left out, wow. and we just keep this thing rolling. We'll see how Pac-12's it goes. Pac-12's getting left out of everything. <laughs> they <laughs> football. are. Sorry, They're guys. getting left out of football. Final What's year. What is that? <laughs> you're you're going to have to catch me up. What's the Pac-12? <laughs> <laughs> That's for another time, Jimmy. Thank you guys so much for your time and uh, appreciate it. What other teams make the college football playoff this season? The Ultimate College Football Preview continues with a look at the top teams from each conference. Follow Locked on SEC to catch that conversation or check out another conference preview by subscribing to all the Locked on Conference shows wherever you get your podcasts. Now that you know who the players are for the SEC, join me, Caroline Fenton, as we break down who makes the college football playoff and who will ultimately win it all. Go to Locked On SEC wherever you get your podcasts for this bonus episode of the Ultimate College Football Preview.